guys, it's Biggs. Welcome back. Now today, you guys can't see it. It's all right here in front of me. You don't even know what's happening. I know what's happening. You don't know what's happening. But today, you guys saw the video of uh, the new shipment of the new random stuff that we got in, some of the weird and creepy crawlies and stuff. Well, in that shipment was another species of isopod. That's uh, these guys right here. You can still see I'm wearing the same shirt because this is literally 10 minutes after that happened. So we're getting ready to land these isopods. We're gonna get them all set up and we're gonna talk about them. Stay tuned. All right, well, the species in question we're talking about today is Porcilio scaber. It's probably one of the most common isopods available in the trade. However, this is a particular cultivar or a line bred morph of Porcilio scaber that has developed these very characteristic patterns. And it's called koi in relationship to the koi or carp, the Asian carp uh, that has all those beautiful colors. So each one of these isopods, every single one of them, is gonna be like a fingerprint. It's gonna be vastly different with little patterns of black spotting and little, little russety orange spots all over them. It's a really, really cool species. And I thought it'd be something cool to add to my collection, even though it's a super common one. I just thought it was really cool because it's something I can tell a story to and it ties the isopods a bit more in with the fish. Now, Priscilio scaber, the one we're going to be talking about, the koi form, the koi form, as I mentioned, is a man-made morph or developed from the naturalized form. Uh, but this one here is actually, an, it originally originated in Europe, but it has been widespread probably through the different transmission of different types of soils and stuff pretty much everywhere in the world. It, uh, uh, Priscilio scaber is available absolutely everywhere in the world naturally. We don't necessarily have it right up here with us, but we do have some that are very, very close to it uh, in, the, in the cold area where we get. Now to set them up, I'm not setting them up any different than maybe my, uh, my dairy cows. They're a very, very easy, very, very prolific species. They'll spawn constantly in season. Uh, so for the tub, we got one of our big tubs. Priscilios tend to like it a little bit drier. So we have the very, very large ventilation on the sides and on the front and on, as you can see, on the back as well. So I've got it this way and it goes into my shelf and this will be the, the, what you guys see as the back. Now I've set it up. It's got a nice loamy compost that is comprised of sea soil, uh, worm castings, orchid bark, uh, a bit of fir bark. It's got lots of long fibered sphagnum moss in it, some crushed oak leaves and whatnot. And then also I have a nice uh, transient warm area, or sorry, not warm, humid area or wet area. And that is to, for the, the gradient of humidity within the enclosure. And that is the wet area. And that is just all long fibered sphagnum moss. And that's for them because isopods, as mentioned, are not bugs, they're crustaceans, which you should know by now. So the container's ready to go. Now we've got a few different pieces of wood available for it. Now these are some different types of woods that were available from the forest, really just outside there. So I know it's clean and it's, uh, there's no insecticides or herbicides or anything like that because I live way out in the middle of the country. Uh, so this is probably some sort of type of poplar or stuff. It, it, it works good as a surface or as a medium for them. I like this one because it's nice and kind of concave. So I can use food when I use the gel foods and different types of foods underneath it. The, the wood itself doesn't come in contact with it. It's a lot of area for the things to colonize. You can also use pieces of cork bark, virgin cork bark, which are available readily at any pet store. They work good. And then the standard or the staple, I do have lots in the garage. It's just, I, I just happen to have this piece and this is fine. And this is actually oak bark. It's very, very thick, rigid, and it gives them some different textures for them to climb on. So the culture itself, as mentioned in the other video, I was able to access from some good friends, uh, uh, my friend Grant Crossman, who's the head guy for uh, uh, Port Credit Pets, which is a massive pet company. It's a retail store. He also has a wholesale side called National Reptile, and he supplies all of Canada pet stores. So I was very excited when they had this one here. It's a very, as I say, it's a common species, so it's not expensive whatsoever. I think this culture was probably only about $30. It's a very readily available species. And they've got it in a nice loamy thing, but we got to get them into their proper container so they can get out and start exploring. Not much to it. You can see the leaf litter and I just kind of drop the container in there and they're going about their thing. Time to figure out, hey, this is a pretty spacious new home. Now, for those that may be new to, say, isopods, when you travel, you go to reptile shows, they're not very prevalent in a lot of the pet stores. Hopefully down the road, that may change. I think this is a very unique, 
easily affordable, easy to keep pet for anybody that wants to kind of dabble their way into possibly keeping a tarantula or a, a scorpion or any sort of type of insect. Even though these aren't insects, a lot of their care is pretty similar in the way that we keep them. Uh, basically, you see that this is just a large shoebox, Sterilite type container, Rubbermaid type container. I've cut the ventilation into the sides, as you guys can see, as you've seen already. Cut the ventilation into the side, and then the lid as well has ventilation cut into the, into the lid as well. So lots of good ventilation for them. Nice loamy soil. These are denizens or animals that live on the bottom of the forest floor. Their job is to be able to break down all the natural or decaying organic matter and bring it back to the forest. So I think these guys are a super cool new addition. I was pretty excited to get them. Porcelio Skaber Koi. They're going, to be, they're going to replicate fairly fast, and because of this koi patterning, they're going to be extremely variable. None will be the exact carbon copy of another. So I think that's, that adds another dimension that's really, really cool. Porcilios are fairly heavy feeders, particularly the fast replicating ones. Uh, I tend to use fish flakes, aquarium fish flakes, a good quality aquarium fish flake. And I also use uh, different types of rapashi gel diets. I'm a very fond of a few of them. I use the ones called Bug Burger. I use the ones called uh, Morning Wood, and I have another one that I, the name escapes me, and I use them all the time, and I often just makes a, mix a batch that I'll feed the fish, and I'll feed the bugs at the same time. Sorry, the isopods. People call them pill bugs, but actually, in all honesty, members of the genus Porcilio are not, in fact, pill bugs, because they cannot roll up in a tight ball. Porcilios are often, by common name, at least in North America, more appropriately called sow bugs. So here's some of the traditional foods that I use with the isopods, particularly with the Persilios, which have a slightly higher protein. These are dried minnows. These are sold in the pet trade often as cat treats or dog treats. They're fine, they're cheap, they're easy, and they're shelf stable because they're dry. This is a high quality uh, fish food. This is a large sinking pellet that would be used for feeding large cichlids or say koi. And uh, this will be perfect because it's like an engineered food. It's all compressed. Uh, it's basically taking the food and compressing it into a pellet form so it's easy to, to feed. And then the standard good quality fish flakes. Usually most of them have a good high, a good protein ratio and a good mix of varieties of diet. Another critical factor, not just with these isopods, but all isopods, all terrestrial isopods have extremely high calcium requirements. And they have this because of their frequent need for molting of their mineralized cuticle, as well to maintain the correct pH within their guts for proper microbial mestizization and digestion of all the plant material, etc., that they consume. So I use this is a reptile calcium substrate, calcium carbonate, readily digestible, and I sprinkle this fairly liberal in the medium when I'm mixing it. And the other one I use is, is cuddle bone, which is a sustainable product from the cuttlefish, often sold in the pet trade for birds. These two things are perfect additions for providing a calcium source for all isopods. All right, guys, one thing that always seems to come up randomly all the time when we, we talk about isopods, or if you talk about people that have all sorts of plants, like, you know, we got the big viv with all the plants there, and I got plants literally cropping up all over the place, and upstairs is no different. There's plants absolutely everywhere. One thing that seems to come up quite frequently is dealing with uh, uh, the little flies, the gnats and stuff. And, like, how do you get them? Well, they're going to come in on all your soils and stuff, and they're just things that are going to be there. So it's not a matter of trying to eradicate them. It's a matter of trying to control them. And there's something that I use in my room that I absolutely love. I'm going to show you what it is. Now this thing needs a little bit of maintenance periodically, and we're gonna do the quick maintenance to show you guys how well it is, but I ordered this off Amazon. It's called the Catchy. I absolutely love it. I have no endorsement of it other than I just enjoy using it. Uh, Amazon does not give me any money for it. I don't know anybody from the company. It's just something I found when my wife started freaking out. It's like, what's it with all these flies everywhere? So it's up there in the, in the top there, and it's got an ultraviolet light. It has a little tiny stick pad in it that you just replace periodically. It works absolute wonders because all the fries are attracted to that light and then they go in and it's got kind of a, a vortex fan that draws them down to the sticky pad and then they're done. It works awesome. Let's take a look. It's a pretty straightforward, simple unit. This thing doesn't, I don't even think this weighs a pound. It weighs nothing. 
It's it's not obtrusive. It's easy. It fit anywhere in your room, anywhere in your thing. I put it up tall because at night time is honestly when these animals are going to be out flying about, and then the, the UV light will be its most effective. I actually put it on a timer, and a timer that way it turns on when all the lights go off, so it's actually more effective, and it uses a lot less power. It's a very, very low voltage thing. It has a little tiny clip-on thing. It's just a simple US low voltage type unit. So it's not going to draw a lot of power. It's not going to cost a lot of money to run. It has a low setting and a high setting. And to change it, all you do is you unclick the bottom here, you push the button, and it opens up. Now give me an idea how effective this thing is. How gross is that? Super gross. And they're super easy. You literally just replace the pads. Pads come in little packs. You can order them off Amazon. Just peel away the sticker. Put it in the unit. Close the unit. Plug it back in. Awesome, awesome product. I give it full 100 points. Great item. If anything not, just to give you a peace of mind and in the family home, this thing's worth its weight in gold. I think it was only about 50 bucks. I'm in Canada too, so 50 bucks is probably only about 30, 35 bucks in the US. Not sure if it's available in Europe, but I'm sure there's something equivalent. But I really can't say enough about this little item. It's an awesome product.